that Crean and I have just published, uh, I, go, I think goes a long way in helping to solve this problem, but involves some pretty far out ideas. And uh, I suppose we get in, should we get into that? Yeah, and well, I, was, I, was, I wanted to, there's in your abstract on the paper, you, you say, you make the fairly definitive statement, we predict as a consequence that the Large Hadron Collider in CERN will never detect exotic real on mass shell particles right. that can explain dark matter. Okay, this is an important prediction. It's kind of like uh, back in the uh, 1880s, Michelson and Morley, physicists at Case Institute of Technology in Cleveland, they built what's called an interferometer and they tried to detect the motion of the Earth through what would, was then called the mechanical ether, which was uh, predicted to exist. And what happened, that experiment was a null experiment. The motion of the Earth through the ether, through the mechanical ether, was undetectable. And uh, although Einstein, although some historians claim that Einstein in 1905, when he was developing the special theory of relativity, was not that aware of the Michelson Morley experiment, nevertheless, Einstein's special theory of relativity explains the Michelson Morley experiment. So sometimes in physics, not getting a result is, creates a revolution in physics. And what I'm claiming in a very similar way is that what they're going to see at the in, in CERN in Geneva at the a Large Hadron Collider, when they look for dark matter particles in the lab, they're not going to find any. Why is that? Because, in my theory, uh, and if they find some, then I'm wrong. Right. Okay. <laughs> this is a crucial test. But because I'm saying, in my theory, the dark matter is not real particles whizzing through space that can cause detectors to click, you know, to irreversibly uh, uh, make an electron cascade to make a, a signal on a, on a, on a oscilloscope screen or, or, or to record it in a computer. They're not going to see anything like that. They may find some interesting exotic particles, but it won't be in enough abundance to explain what's called omega dark matter equals 0.23. And this is completely independent of the Higgs boson that they're looking for. Yeah, completely for. independent of Higgs boson, yeah. Right. Completely independent of Higgs boson. There may be some connections, but it doesn't really uh, involve Higgs, Higgs field. Um, unless you were to say somehow Higgs boson. No, I, I don't think that, that, that'll that work. I'd have to check that, but I doubt that that'll work. I don't think there's any real connection there. Um, so, uh, so this is an important, crucial test of what I'm proposing. I'm proposing that, that dark matter are... Uh, zero point energy, negative zero point energy of equal and opposite positive pressure, whereas dark energy is positive zero point energy density of equal and opposite negative pressure. And they incurred a ratio of like uh, 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 two thirds to one third or two to one in our particular universe. Now, why, our, why, why is it that ratio? That's what's called, uh, then we have to get into the multiverse idea that we live on a cosmic landscape, that's a parallel universe. It turns out there are many alternate worlds, and we just happen to be on the one that has that particular ratio of uh, dark energy to dark matter. There could be universes next door that have different ratios, but it turns out, and this is what's called the anthropic principle, that uh, things are rigged in our universe in such a way that uh, we're here, that life can, can evolve. It turns out there are a couple of, I think, uh, Sir Martin Rees, who I knew back in Cambridge in the 60s. Uh, he's now uh, Master of Trinity College, Cambridge. He is president of the uh, Royal Society in London that Isaac Newton uh, uh, st uh, was uh, uh, started. Uh, he uh, is also British Astronomer Royal. And uh, he has written a book called Just Six Numbers, a very nice little book, which shows that there are six basic numbers, me experimental numbers, that uh, physicists and astrophysicists are measuring. And if those numbers were only slightly different, were only slightly different by a few percent, one way or the other, either bigger or smaller, then life as we know it would not have evolved. Carbon-based life would not be possible. The stars as we know it, the sun could not have formed, so things like that. And so it's almost as though we're living in a designer universe. Well, doesn't that imply that... Well, I, we live in a Versace universe, you know. <laughs> but doesn't that imply that, that the universe is teleological and that it's goal-directed? That, that the one, future is already predetermined in some sense? Now, that's one, uh, that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is, is to apply Darwinian evolution and to say it's all random chance because there are many, many universes. And most of the universes are, have... The, the six numbers that Martin Rees uh, talks about are di totally different, totally random. And, we, and there's just this, this very small 
a fraction of all the infinity of the universes that happen to contain life. It's just a matter of ch random chance and kind of Darwinian evolution, but on a vast kind of uh, a multiverse scale. And that's called the cosmic landscape approach, and uh, the, you know, that's a possible approach. Uh, uh, it's been criticized for reasons that, uh, in principle, if we cannot observe these uh, universes next door, these parallel universes, then it's not really scientific. So, you know, we're, it's back to almost religious faith as to which way to look at well, it. Well, can't you make the same claim uh, as a counter-argument to what you're, you're stating about the fact that, that you predicting that dark matter will never be observed by detectors? If, it's, if it, it can never be observed by detectors, then we can only imply its existence by inference through its absence. No, no, no. We know, we know, we know that. Uh, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, no, the dark matter is virtual. We know there's virtual matter. We know that through things like called lamp shift. We, we observe its effects indirectly in quantum electrodynamics. Okay. So there are uh, the, the uh, dark matter and dark energy will cause shifts of spectral lines. For example, the dark matter effect in quantum electrodynamics is called um, uh, vacuum polarization shift of. Uh, of say certain spectral lines in in, in uh, atomic hydrogen, okay, and that's been measured very accurately, okay. And the the uh, the dark energy is called the land. It was the basic thing of lamp shift, called virtual photons. So we know those things exist, but we only know them indirectly through indirect shifts of atomic spectral lines, for example. But what happens in Einstein's general theory of relativity of gravity from 1915, something called the equivalence principle, which is basically that all forms of energy bend space-time, cause space-time to curve, okay? So we know that if there is quantum fluctuation vacuum energy, it's got to have a gravitational effect. And we also know from Einstein's theory that if the uh, zero-point pressure is negative, as we have for virtual light inside the vacuum, then that causes an anti-repulsive gravitational effect. And if you have virtual electron positron, positron pairs, that causes an attractive effect. So we have a natural picture for dark matter as an attractive field and dark energy as a repulsive field within both the Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, and general relativity. So it, it all kind of fits. Will we be able to ever measure dark energy? Yeah, well, you have. I mean, you have measured it. We have. That's what this, That's exactly what the spectral shifts of the type 1a supernova measures. If okay. that, you could deduce a dark energy density. Okay, now it turns out Okay, here's the important thing. Now we're getting to. It. Turns out, uh, one of the things that Einstein's theory predicts are what are called horizons. And um, it's hard to explain this without a picture. Uh, but what happens is that, um, that uh, for example, let's consider a black hole. Let's consider a black hole that's not rotating. The black hole has a surface. That surface is called the event horizon. What is an event horizon? An event horizon happens when, if you imagine a beam of light being emitted right on, on this surface, the event horizon, what happens? The light itself is trapped. It just is trapped and it just circulates around this, on a circle on this sphere, this event horizon sphere. It circles that way. Okay. And if you're inside this horizon, if you're inside this horizon and you try to shoot a flashlight pointing to the outside, you try to shoot light to get outside. You'll never see it. What will happen is both of the light just bends around, just goes a U-turn, it goes right into what's called the singularity. Mm -hmm. The singularity is what's called is where the curvature becomes infinite. And in fact, uh, if you if you happen to be so as unfortunate as to fall through the event horizon of the black hole, uh, in a certain depending on how big the black hole is, eventually you'll be crushed out of existence. What's going to happen is you fall into the black hole. Suppose you're falling radially directly into the black hole. What happens is you get stretched. You, you know, you get stretched into like spaghetti, and you also get squeezed in the transverse direction. 